Uh, we're up and running. Welcome everybody to tonight's episode of Profound States. And as your uh, host, Charles Michael Beaver, I'm here. Uh, and, and tonight we're presenting Linda and Richard Smith. Uh, they're both experiencers, authors, and uh, Linda is a multi-generational experiencer. I'm not sure if Richard is yet, since it didn't say it, whether he was or not in his bio. So in any case, uh, welcome to that show, Linda and Richard. Thank Smith. you. Oh, thank you. Good to be Richard here. Smith. So uh, I guess we can start with the good, good part right off the bat. Uh, who wants to start first? Who I, I know Linda's goes back multi generational. Richard, does yours go back multi generational? It does, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Well, but neither of us found that out until after you know talking to par our parents and stuff after things started happening. So whoever wants to start in on, on their experience first, I. Well, I'm going to hear both of them, so it really doesn't matter who goes first and who goes second. But it does. They're both very know. lengthy, so. <laughs> Go ahead. Um, yeah. So I was born in 1964, and I can say that probably my very first experience that I can remember was about 1967, pushing 1968, on Long Island, New York. Um, I lived in a small little town called Uniondale. And it was, I always had an issue sleeping when I was a kid, still do to this day, but I would have a air quotes nightmare and would walk into my parents' bedroom to go back to sleep. And this one particular night, which to me was in my memory, the beginning of everything, I got to the hallway where there was my parents' door, my bedroom door and the bathroom door in that little corner there. And I saw feet. And I, in my mind, I just said, oh, that's the dog's feet. But as I got older, I realized that they were glowing. They had like this luminescent glow to them. And only when I was older did I realize my dog, German Shepherd, their, their feet don't glow. So it wasn't until I was much older, I would probably say about 10, that my sister and I started having experiences. And my sister was the one who coined the phrase, the kings are coming, because that's what she called them. I don't know why to this day she won't talk about it. Um, we, would, we would just instinctively know that they were coming and we would run into our bed and pull the covers up to our, our nose and just wait for whatever was gonna happen. And then of course we don't remember anything after that. And then nothing that I can remember happened in my teens or my 20s. It wasn't until 1995, was it five or four? I can't remember if it was December of 94 or, De no, it was December of 94 that my mom started showing interest in going out and she was with a book club. That's what she told us. It turned out to be a UFO group. She didn't tell any of us that she was, you know, with this UFO group. Um, until I saw one of the books that she was reading in the book club and I said, hmm, that's interesting. I didn't know you were into UFOs or whatever. And that's when everything just opened up. Pandora's box exploded at that point because my sister and I were sitting there in the kitchen with her talking about it. I think it was Zachariah Sitchin book that she was reading. And she said something to the effect of, um, you're interested in UFOs or experiences or I don't remember it was too long ago and my sister and I just looked at each other and said well I guess we have to tell her now and she goes tell me what so we started telling her about what happened when we were kids and she's like why didn't you ever tell me or your father we were too scared we thought we were going to get in trouble so from that it was as if that set off a light switch and from that moment on my mom was constantly compelled to go look out the kitchen window every night and 99% of the time there was something going on across the house, whether it was a ship, a bunch of ships. Um, I was having experiences on a regular basis. 
my sister, my father, who never spoke about UFOs ever, started seeing things with us. I was doing, I was a nail tech and I was doing nails at home at the time. My customers were starting to see stuff when I would walk them outside. Um, I have one customer that never came back after one incident. Um, our neighbors started seeing things. One neighbor got so scared she packed, she sold the house and she took her kids and husband and moved somewhere else. Um, it was just one thing after another from 1990, December of 94 on for the rest of my life. I mean, there's so many things I don't I wouldn't even know where to start to tell, tell you what I've experienced and which is why with the pushing of my husband, I finally wrote the book in 2017, 17 or 18. Yeah, I think it was 18. So and I was Freeport, New York. Where all yeah, it, it, tra- was. it followed us from Uniondale, New York to Freeport, New York, which are both two small, relatively small towns. When I moved to Freeport, it was only 40,000 people living there. No less than that. But, I mean, there's just so many things. You would have to ask me something in order for me to say yes or no, it didn't happen, because there was so many things. Still to this day, and I'm 59 years old. Sorry, we have two cats that decide to have to fight right now. (laughs) So, So, as far as the multi-generational thing... After my mom had started having experiences, my mother had this incredible memory where she would read a book and see something. She started seeing markings on my customers that would come over. She started seeing triangular marks on everybody. And if something would happen, she'd say, oh, yeah, I just read about that on page 64, third paragraph in so-and-so's book. She had incredible recall. I was going somewhere. Oh, and then she, she said to me, well, I think your grandmother probably had experiences too, her mom. And I said, why? What makes you say that? She said, well, because she's always had this very strange scoop mark on her shin. And my grandmother always told my mom, I think it was when I tripped over barbed wire. But my mom found the same words in a book a few years after she, my, my grandmother told her that, and it was some other experiencer who had a scoop mark on their shin, who also said that they had a vague memory from their childhood that they tripped over barbed wire. So my mom never got a direct answer from my grandmother that she had any UFO experiences. It's just solely based on that, that my mom fully believed that my grandmother was an experiencer as well. So did you know your grandmother? Yes, I did. She died when I was pregnant with my second son, who's now 33. So I, she lived until 1990. Did she tell you her experiences? No. She wouldn't talk she never, about it. She did never discuss any of that kind of stuff. So what about your mom? Did she tell you her experiences? Oh, my mom. And anytime we had an experience, it was either myself and my mom, my mom. <laughs> My dad together, my mom and my sister, my mom and my my boys. Um, so yes, we would compare notes because she started keeping a diary and I started keeping a diary. And my book is those two diaries put together. And there's a lot of stories that match that she wrote it and then I wrote it and then we compared stories later. So what, what, uh, how many um, types of aliens have uh, you and your mom, you and your family, and his family, him and his family. How many? How many different races do are we representing here with all of that? So there's only one way that I can. Um, I've never had my mom explain to me what types she has seen. She only remembers seeing, and we've physically seen ourselves, the ships. Anything that happens after that, in my mother's recollection, there's nothing unless she tells me. Even even stuff that she said was in during her dream state, she never described any alien creatures. I, on the other hand, have seen a bunch of them in a classroom type setting from when I was younger up until my youngest child, which is now 27. And it was in this 
just very nondescript room, plain white room, no visible doors. Um, but there was human children and a bunch of different alien species, <clears throat> excuse me, children in the room all learning, but not the typical United States classroom type learning. There were no desks. They were all just either standing or sitting around on the floor. Um, most of them doing some kind of mental telekinesis type um, things. It, it, there's so many different. There was one little like jellyfish looking thing, just a little blob of a thing. So what of all the uh, psychokinetic uh, things that you were taught? Is there do you remember that part of your experience that the teaching as a child uh, being in the room with the you know, you, you mentioned you were there. But yes, do you, do you actually I was there remember? as myself for myself, but I was also there. They like to call me the Pied Piper of the children. So my job from the age of 10 on was. To take the children on board that they had just brought on board for teachings and bring them to the classroom like an escort. That's what I remember the most. I don't remember the teachings specifically until I got older when I remember them teaching me how to fly a very small ship. That's another story. Um, I would bring children to the classroom. And I don't know how often, but it almost it feels inside of me that it was almost nightly that that's what I was doing. That was my job. So, so do, you, do you know why they were teaching you what they taught you? I mean, do you remember specifically what they taught you? And then uh, the second part of that question is, do you remember why they taught it to you? I just have this inner knowing that I was chosen for a reason, but I don't know exactly what I've I still haven't quite figured that out other than I'm supposed to heal people. Um, One of the things they were teaching you too was how to manage the control panel. For the yeah, ship. but that was later on, okay. much later on, as, as I would say more towards my 20s, 30s. That's my job changed. Um, I don't remember specifically what they were teaching me. What I do know, which I thought was very odd, was at my public middle school when I was younger, I would get called every once in a while to this counselor's office. I don't even know who this person was. I don't remember. But they were doing like these psychic tests on me. They were they were little cards and they had them face up, the back of them face up, and they would ask me what the symbol was on the other side. If I could tell that they were testing my my abilities and I found that as an adult to be very odd why they were doing this in elementary school to me. Like one had one would be a circle, one was a star, a triangle and I think a square and I think squiggly lines too. Yeah, I, I, think, th I think they're called Zener cards, but I don't okay. remember. Yeah. Uh, but but why would I, they be doing that in public elementary school? That to well, me I found very bizarre. I. I had uh, a friend who um, he went through all kinds of training uh, with, you know, putting the uh, the half golf ball things over your eyes to cut out the light and uh, in elementary school. Of, well, I don't remember what level that where they were at. I mean, this may have been way beyond elementary school, just something they got into, but it wasn't a personal thing. It was something somebody was doing to them or with them or for them. And it was some kind of, it wasn't necessarily schooling. It was just something somebody chose to do to have all these paranormal, uh, you know, they did the test like you were talking about with the cards and they did the golf ball things over their eyes. And I think they did all kinds of paranormal stuff until it got too weird. And they stopped it, but uh, no, it wasn't 
it, I don't think that was in elementary though. That's that just reminded me of that when you started talking about the Zinger mm -hmm. cards or the the psychic test cards that. Uh, Thank you. Year. Elementary school. Uh, elementary school. I started elementary school in 69 and then I went into middle school in 1979. Okay. It's not, it was, it was in that time frame in United States history that um, there was a lot of activity all of a sudden that came about. Psychic testing? With the government wanting to test things. Now that could have been influenced by extraterrestrials to some degree, mm -hmm. I'm not sure, but you see this, um, um, you see this symbolized in movies like Altered States from 1980 or later on Stephen King's story, Firestarter. That's what that was all about. All those college tests and maybe even elementary tests, watching these children grow as they get older to see how they evolve in this so-called X class which is why they're called the X-Men in the movies. They're well, also the same thing. You know. I remember being <clears throat> interviewed by somebody else a couple of years ago that said they, they were a little bit older than me, but they do remember having those cards and being asked those questions in their public elementary school as well in a different state. So I don't know what was going on back then, but. Well, my, my wife, um, her, um, mother was into learning about you know all this uh, et and paranormal she was a um a fan of captain of uh, william shatner was the uh, hunk of those days and uh she was a william shatner fan her mother was a william shatner fan and uh, her mother would bought a telescope and all the kids came over and looked at the stars and and she was into ufos and science science and fiction and stuff and uh our mother was very different from my wife and uh but kind of ahead of her time but my the reason why i bring that up is because uh i think that the mother if i'm not mistaken uh bought uh the games that they had at that time about uh parent uh teaching there was somebody who had a game out that was very popular that it might have had Zener cards, but it was something about teaching uh, each person about their or developing their psychic abilities. Mm -hmm. And you'd have to go back find a historian or something to figure it out. But uh, mm -hmm. they had a very popular game back then that you would buy to help you develop your paranormal mm -hmm. uh, psychic talent. And it mm -hmm. was very popular back in those days. And uh, so that that what we're, what your experience through elementary school may have been an offshoot of that, where people who just happened to be running that school decided they wanted to explore the paranormal also, or, or the government could have been doing that. Yeah. Uh, you know, the China did the, um, you know, the, the search to find out all their, who all their psychic kids were. And Russia did the same thing with their kids to find out who, or just people in general, uh, to find out who was who had the psychic abilities. And uh, Nina Kunigina and uh, certain famous, that's not her real name, but uh, other fa very famous Russian women were uh, discovered because the Russians went looking around for those talents everywhere. And so I think the US government uh, did the same thing here. I wouldn't uh, be surprised with you and and the rest of uh, and your generation. I didn't go through that, but uh, I guess it's probably different for every school district, you know. Yeah. So um, uh, we can either go deeper, any more detail about your experiences, or we can switch to Richard. Whatever you guys there's, want to do. There's plenty more, and we we met each other in 1995 and found out through lengthy conversations and me going under um, hypnosis. I've been I've been under three or four times with two diff three different um, hypnotherapists. And we found out that he was one of the children 
that I took to the classroom. Mm. But we didn't meet until we were adults on Earth here in until December of 95. And that was because I was <laughs> putting on my own uh, art exhibition at college, which was all the artwork I had done on, of all things, extraterrestrial contact, alien abduction, and the social themes that it related to. And, you know, uh, my professors allowed me to focus on that. Uh, and so her mom, who was in the group Star People, she mentioned, I was part of that too. So her mom knew I was doing this opening reception. Her mom tells her one night, hey, you want to go with me? I'm going to go see this guy who's an artist who does alien art, you know. And Linda said yes. And that's how we met at the opening reception at the gallery that night. Because, uh, of, because of the artwork. So do you guys believe that the aliens got you guys together? Yes, absolutely. Yes. In fact, when Linda and I met, Linda was very pregnant. I was married at the time by, to somebody else. <laughs> very pregnant uh, with my third child. And it was the most bizarre meeting between him and I. I took one look at her when I saw her come into the gallery and um, I just had that feeling that I had to know her, I had to go meet her, I had to say hi, but there was something familiar too. And mm -hmm. as a single guy who had never been married, the most bizarre thing that night was that I saw she was pregnant, um, couldn't miss that. And the first thing I saw, uh, the first thing that came to mind was that one's mine. And where that thought came from, don't know. But looking at her pregnant, I just knew that who, who she was pregnant with belonged to me. So you think the child that she had in her womb at the time was your child? Yes. And when we started putting the pieces together, backtracking to when she know she conceived, it had nothing to do with her husband. Yeah, then that's at one the of the time. stories in my book is the night that I went to sleep. According, you know, uh, do you have children? No. Oh, OK. So when you go to an obstetrician, they have this they used to have this is I'm just showing my age. They used to have this little paper wheel and they would ask you the last date of your menstrual period and they would spin it and then they guesstimate when you conceived and when your due date is. So I went when I first found out I was pregnant with her, um, I went to the doctor and of course that question was asked and he did his little spinny thing and the date was April 11th as far as where I potentially could have conceived, which actually coincides with a, um, an experience that had, I had written in my diary the day after it happened, which was April 11th, and she was born on January 8th. So I can tell you to this day, my husband and I did not have sex that night because he was already passed out. Her dead asleep her ex yeah my ex sorry <laughs> my ex-husband when i came to bed my mom and i were meeting up with um an experiencer james james lafonte yeah. is his name right yeah james lafonte was a very well-known experiencer on long island back in the 90s i have no idea where he disappeared to but he was coming over to talk to my mom and i was part of the conversation but it was 11 something at night and I was getting really tired and I went to bed and within what felt like seconds after my head hitting the pillow I got this panic-stricken feeling come through me like somebody was in the room with me then I felt this heaviness over me I had like pins and needles all over me I couldn't move it was dark in the room but I knew I wasn't alone and I, within seconds after that, gone. I don't remember anything. And then I woke up in a panic and it was two hours later. So what happened in those two hours back then, I had no recollection of at all. Only to find out I was pregnant a few weeks later. So, uh, where do we go from here? I, I don't know how deep you want to go 
you said it's you all out there. It's it's very public. It's all out there in my book. So ask away. I. How did you? There was something about what made. What is it that made you realize it was supposed to be twins? Oh, so I was. Did you hear his question? Yes. Okay, so. Early in my pregnancy, I was probably 13, 14 weeks, I started bleeding at work. And I went I went into panic mode because this is my third child. I had never bled before when I was pregnant with any of them. And it wasn't a bright red blood. It was more like a rusty color. So that's just, and I used to work in an OB's office. So that just, the, the panic button, the panic bell went off in my head. And I told my boss and I drove straight to the doctor's office and he, he did an ultrasound and sent me in his office and he came back in and he said, I have good news and I have bad news. I said, well, okay. He said, the good news is you're still pregnant. The bad news is you lost a twin. Oh, okay. I didn't know I had twins. But back then they really didn't do the ultrasounds like they do now really early. So we didn't know. A few months after my daughter was born, I had an experience at night with my mom. She doesn't remember the whole thing, but I remember it still to this day like it happened yesterday. It's 27 years later. We were in this room. It was a very sterile looking medical room, but not like in a hospital. It was very, very plain. The, the exam beds looked totally different. The instruments looked different. We were sitting in some chair off in the corner was the exam area. And you couldn't tell, but until the door opened, that there was a door in the room. The door opens and there's three beings standing there. One of them is holding a baby. There was a short one and two one average size and one a little taller and the tallest one was the one holding the baby they spoke to me telepathically there was no mouth movements from anybody during this this experience and they walked slowly towards me and i instinctively knew that that was my baby because she looked at me with a, a knowing but she looked different than my daughter she looked a little bit older. I should say she looked a little more aware because we're talking six months, I think. Mm -hmm. it's about six months after they were born. She looked more aware of her, um, the whole thing. She looked like she understood what was being said telepathically. She had enough hair on her head that she looked like a chemo patient that was losing their hair so it was kind of like splotchy um they let me hold her they they explained to me in that meeting why she was with them and why my other one was with me they explained that they had to for safety reasons separate them that they would be safer apart rather than being raised together and if i start crying excuse me <laughs> Because it still bothers me to this day. I never got a clear answer as to what the impending danger was that they had to separate them. That was all I was told was that they, whoever the, this race of beings were, had to keep her and I was allowed to keep Jackie. So, um, what did the three beings look like? So, um, <clears throat> the short one was, I hate to say it was the typical gray that everybody used because that word gray has gotten so overused. It wasn't like this. It wasn't like the pointy pear-shaped head they they were short like that type of gray but more of like a brownish tanny leathery skin um the tallest one that was holding the baby had almost like a white luminescent skin 
um, she was, and I say she because I, I found out many years later, only maybe a couple of years ago, who she is. Um, her name is Kananda. Um, they were three separate species, three separate groups of beings, but they were all together on the ship. Um, the other one, I can't, I really can't say I remember anything specific because I was more focused on that baby than those beings. And the only reason why I took more of a look at the tall one was because she was holding the baby. Um, I had uh, a little time with her and then they took her away. And that's all I remember from that experience. But if you look at my daughter now, <laughs> it's crazy to say this, but she looks a little bit like my ex-husband. She looks, looks and acts a lot like Rick and me. So my, my educated guess is that she was genetically modified with my ex-husband's sperm, Rick's, mine, and possibly alien. Because when she was older, about, well, she started speaking very young. She was always a very beyond her years child. When she was about three, she used to, I used to catch her talking when I thought she had imaginary friends. And then one day I just couldn't take it anymore. And I, my mother and I went into her room and I said, Jackie, who are you talking to? And she just turned around very matter of fact and said, Cadus, Betus, and Radus. Yeah. Which I thought were very odd imaginary friend names for a little three-year-old to make up. You know, while I'm thinking of it, Cadus, Betus, and Radius, mm -hmm. that sounds very much like the same group that Kananda came from. They sound like Ponty names. Correct. Yeah, they do. So we're referring to a... Uh, they're supposedly oh. a race of beings that live under the Sandia Mountains here in New Mexico. There's and they're a, called the Ponty? The Ponty. Yeah, I'm, and, I'm familiar with them. Yeah. Okay. But now I'm thinking of it, those names that she brought Right, up. because there's radar. Well, they call it radar. That could be radius. I even talked to Sue about that. Yeah. Anyway, um, and she went on talking to them probably until she was about nine. And she, one day, when she was a little bit older, maybe five or six, she was already in kindergarten. I I. What I would frequently ask her, do you still see Cadis and Betas? Do you still, you know, do they come still talk to you and stuff? And she said, yeah, one teaches me math. One teaches me science mm -hmm. and something else. I don't remember. It's all in my diary. It's almost 30 years ago. So there, um, some, they might, Linda and I came across something, you know, probably around, uh, 2018 to um, that might, I thought, have given some insight as to why her twin sister was separated from her and why they took that one. Um, oh, okay. I had, uh, I had always known about Bud Hopkins' book, Intruders, and I also knew about the uh, movie that was loosely based on it with Richard Crenna. That same name, Intruders. And I had told Linda about it, and she had never heard of it. Never. I said, well, this is a cool flick to watch, especially with your experiences. It centers a lot around the stuff that Linda would talk about. Um, and I said, I think, you know, you might want to sit down and watch this. So here we are <laughs> watching, I think this was a movie that came out in the 80s, TV movie, and um, there was still a lot of powerful stuff they represented in that movie and they come to a certain part which was damn near perfect to mimicking Linda's experience which I'm sure a lot of other women have had the same experience of having twins and losing one but it really wasn't lost it was taken so there's a part in the movie where they show this mother who's been through a living hell trying to discover what happened they take her on the ship and it's very similar setting to what Linda described. And one of these tall beings um, brings her baby to her that was taken from her. And they proceed to explain to her telepathically that 
the baby has to stay with us. They cannot go back to Earth. They cannot live in your environment and they cannot even live in our environment. They have to stay here in a special environment because they are referred to as the children of the in-between. And at that point, Linda burst out in tears seeing that part because I felt it gave some insight as to what the aliens who presented her with her mm -hmm. other daughter might have been trying to tell her that these are the children of the in-between. They're not exactly in an extraterrestrial setting. They're not exactly mm -hmm. able to live on Earth. They're kept separate and distinct as a hybrid. Um, and that gave some powerful insight as to Linda's experiences too. This is the... <sighs> Light is yeah. light. Turn this off here. here see this is way. this is. Yeah, go over here and turn it. No. Nope. It. There you go. No, that's too angled though. Uh, From, give me it. Yeah, it's the light here. If you uh, close your window a little bit, it might help. Unfortunately, we have it. Well, as it close is as we closed. Can and... Okay. I don't know if you can see it. Can you see? Yeah, that, that right there. That that's probably the best. No, back. Well, that's that's right there. So that's probably the best you're gonna get. Yeah. This this is Cananda, mm -hmm. and this was drawn by an art, a local artist here in New Mexico, um, who actually has regular conversations with the Ponte. They visit her and her husband at their house. She has a really good relationship with a bunch of them that visit regularly. So you was, talk, are you talking about uh, the so lady? What? Sue Walker. Yeah, that's what, yeah. that's what I thought you were talking about. Yeah, and we found out after I met her, um, we were talking about, because they live ne very near us in Rio Rancho, <clears throat> Rio Rancho, New Mexico. So um, we were talking one day after she came to our UFO group that we run, and we started talking about where she grew up and... I started putting two and two together because my mom's maiden name is Walker. And it turns out that there's a 99% chance that we're cousins. Hmm. And I just found it very funny that we both end up in Rio Rancho. We both have had experiences. It just. And there's well, that Walker bloodline. Yeah. Yeah. And she, I told her about that experience and I described the being. And then during one of my regression therapies, that name Kananda was what came out. And I had verification from this guy named Jeff Demers, who knows the Ponte as well. He's friends with Sue. He lives in Michigan, I think. Yeah, I think so. Kananda is real. She is part of the Ponte. And they were very surprised, meaning the Ponte, that I remembered her, that I wasn't supposed to remember her. But she has been assigned to watch over me for a long time. So you believe that uh, that at least one of the races that that has taken you is the Ponte? Now, now knowing who they are, yes. But I didn't know that back then, 27 years ago. But you've also had another interesting race of beings you described as the elders. Yes. So the shorter one belongs to a group of beings that I have always referred to as the elders. They, they wear this robe looking almost, <laughs> almost like a nun's robe that has like the, the space in between where there's another garment underneath. Mm. Um, and it's like a front and back cape type thing. It's very hard to describe unless somebody draws it for me. But they have this insignia on their on their uh, left breast area. And for the longest time, I kept telling my mom it looked like the Star of David when I was younger. Um, and I mean younger in my 30s. <clears throat> it turns out it's the, what's it called? The... Oh, the tetrahedron? Tetrahedron, yeah. yeah. It's a tetrahedron shape. Oh, you're, you're talking about the uh, metaphysical vehicle that you're supposed to travel in with your body through space. Yes, that shape. 
But they seem to have that as a symbol on there. That's their symbol on their, I'm using air quotes, cape that they that they wear, that I've seen them wear. So you're, you're talking about the upside down and right side up triangle uh, combined, right? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Okay, so uh, uh, tetrahedron, what's the, there's another name. Yes, there is, and I am drawing a complete blank. Yeah, well, so uh, it relates to the Star of David, too. But, but that's what I used to call it when I was yeah. in my 30s. I was trying to describe it to my mom. Mm -hmm. And where's my book? I have my book. Hold on. Try turning that light on there. That switch. Yeah, see if that. Yeah, that's a little better. Okay. I feel You're like I was fading. Your skin now. Yeah, I felt like I was fading into the mist here. <laughs> Uh, I thought you were overlit, but actually you're underlit. Let me try. Does that work? There you go. Uh, I mean, you. Uh, so she went to get her book, right? Yeah, she'll be right back. Um, you got it. Okay, here she comes. So. Many, 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 many years ago, I, in part of my, my diary, I drew a picture of what I could remember about the elders. They have hair. So it's an, it, it's another gray race. Yeah, with hair and more defined lips. Hold it up again one more time. And why why the uh, why the hair overlay, just to look more human? I get, I don't know. I never asked them. It could have been. It could have been a wig. I don't know. It could have made. It could have been to make me feel more comfortable to have somebody who looks more human. To to, but they've been around with me and my sister for a long time. I yes. call them the elders. That's not what. They have said. Um, it could have been one of those phases of crossbreeding too. Yeah, they the could be hybrids. I don't know. With human so, so what about the race in the middle? Is that the one? The elders are the short ones, right? Shortest ones? Yeah, the elders are the short ones. Well, okay, there's the a few Matthew. different short ones that have been around in my life, but the ones that have been around a long time are the elders. This is another race that this is that brown leathery skin that I was telling you about. Yes. But you see the bulbous head that they have? Yes. This is me in this weird looking sci-fi, I call it a dentist chair. They had put copper headphones on my head, but the, the round discs sat on my temples. And I, even under regression, had the worst headache from remembering that. I don't know what they were doing. But it looked like an MRI machine behind me that he was, he, I don't even know if it was a he, that it was pressing buttons on. But that chair sat, it, it looked like a ball and it kind of would swivel in any which way. It was the most bizarre looking chair I've ever seen. There's so many things in here. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Linda does have a lot of illustrations in yeah. here. Yeah. It's crazy. But um, I mean, it's called the Kings are coming, you know. Right. Uh, it's crazy. So I, I look at it, it's my life and I look at it and I still can't believe that my entire life has been surrounded with experiences. And to me, I find it very normal. <laughs> I don't know, I just. So, so okay, so the uh, elders of the, Shortest, uh, the ponte, the, 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 the ponte, the, the one in between. I, I, I don't know. I, I can't tell you what they look like because I don't remember. But I know that there were three beings that walked in with that baby. So you've had many other experiences. Go through, go through some of your other onboard experiences. I don't even know where to start. There's so many. So there is one. Start from the earliest and work your so way. I, was, I, was, I can say that I was 11 because that is a very meaningful number for me. Um, that was my, 
<laughs> that was my initiation into the sisterhood, which is a an extraterrestrial group of beings. The majority of them were women. They're human. They're all different races of beings. And they they initiated me into becoming Sister Aries, which is another name that I go by, um, at 11. But a few minutes prior to my initiation, there was a little red-haired boy that I was always with that decided he was going to destroy the ship that we were on by creating holes in it. I'll let him tell the story. That was not a decision. That was an accident. So <laughs> Right. Says the curious little boy that one was told, don't touch anything, decides to touch something. So we both um, have a mutual being that has been with us. I, I don't call her mother. He does. I don't... I don't remember exactly what I call her, but in the book that he wrote, he brought it back to me. Her name is Prima Mati. Anyway, she was escorting me and I was holding his hand because he's younger than me. I was walking him. She was escorting me to the room of my initiation. And when the door opened, I saw this blue glow. I saw a bunch of people sitting in it looked like um, stadium seating, but like an old, well, not old, but um, what do they call that? Bleachers where one is above the yeah. next, but in, in a semicircle. Yeah. It was and almost like a... they were the council. Mm -hmm. It was very futuristic looking in there. And I was to stand in the center on this raised platform where there was this holographic glow coming down is and that's what illuminated the room and there was a holographic image of a being that was there to initiate me into the sisterhood and that was at age 11. and i had looked at her um photo album and she pulled out the picture of herself at the age of 11 and i said that's the girl I was with. That was, yes, that's the same girl I was with and picked it out right away. It's a photograph of her that she has of herself when she was 11 years old in her family albums is the exact same image of the girl that I was with on the, on the ship mm -hmm. and went around with. So, um, so what did you do on the ship that, that was bad? That was bad. What happened? So mother, she's a, 15 foot praying mantis type being turned to him as she was walking me in the room and said, I'll be right back. Don't touch anything. Go ahead. So I'm standing there outside and I happened to notice that blue glow, but the door was shut because I wasn't allowed to go in, but it was left conveniently open a jar, just a crack where I could still see through there. Um, Someone else caught me peeking and another, I guess another entity walked up and slammed the door in my face. Um, so I'm thinking, okay, I guess I'll just sit here and wait. And then I happened to know, to see this other door at the end of a corridor. Um, I was like, hmm, what's behind there? It was like a silver metal door. The whole thing had the, uh, the look of a, like a blue, bluish tint to the metal in the corridor, you know, ceiling, floor, walls. Everything was smooth. Um, so having nothing else to look at other than smooth walls, that one mystery door was real interesting to me. I walked over to it, and all I had to do is hold my hand on it, and it opened up. Well, inside was the coolest thing that a kid my age could ever find. It was this mm, semi-transparent, mostly transparent, cylindrical thing. And it looked like a very sophisticated, something along the lines of a glass tube with metal contraptions wrapped around it. And inside seemed to be some unexplainable things, contraptions on the inside. So I was like, oh, what does this do? I wasn't intending to do anything. All I did was put my hands on it and suddenly it came to life and lit up, lifted itself off the floor, 
started floating out of this room, which I now realized was some kind of a closet area. And I thought, oh, great. I am in trouble. They told me not to touch anything. And now this thing is running loose down the hallway. <laughs> so whatever the hell this thing was, I went and jumped on it. Full body hug, legs and arms to try and stop it. That kid my age, that wasn't going to stop it. Though it did knock it off balance. So while it's off balance, it's now bouncing like a pogo stick down the corridor. I didn't realize what was happening as I'm trying to hold on to it. And now I'm spinning around it and just this is just turning into a worse scenario now. All of a sudden, the crone comes out from the meeting hall, sees this chaos, uh, waves her, the crone, also referred to as mother, waves her hand, stops it, sends it back to the closet, shuts the door and looks at me and then looks down the corridor and I didn't understand what she was looking at. I turn around. Everywhere this thing hit the floor down the corridor had punctured a hole straight through to the next level of the ship. And I'm looking down at one of the holes, and I see other extraterrestrial beings looking up at me like, what the hell is going on up there? <laughs> and the crone's like, I told you not to touch anything. This is why. Now, mind you, he was five at the time. And... I was like, well, I didn't know it was going to do that. All I wanted to do was just touch it to see what it was. Didn't realize it was interactive to being touched. And what the hell it actually was, I don't know. It looked like a power device, some kind of generator. I'm not sure. Whatever it was, I was never allowed to go near it again. So, um, yeah. And that's when, after her ceremony was done... The crone looked at her and said, from here on, you're in charge of watching yep. him. Keep him out of trouble. We don't, you know, we don't need him destroying the ship again. So, <laughs> um, yeah, that How, was a funny moment. He was five. How old were you? Eleven. We're set. We're oh, so six and a half years apart. That half is really important. Okay. <laughs> so, uh, Linda. Yes. Why weren't you watching him? I was being initiated into the sisterhood. It was oh. my ceremony. They took me into that room and left him in the hallway for like three seconds alone. And he decides to go touch something. There was no expectation of a five-year-old finding anything to get into in an empty corridor with smooth walls. They didn't <laughs> know you very well. And yet I find the one closet door at the end that I wasn't supposed to find. So, <clears throat> To this day... He still touches things when he's not supposed to. He's never learned his lesson. That's how you go through life. Yeah. That's okay. how you discover, okay? Well, to be honest, <laughs> that's what boys do. Boys yes, I know. Things. Yes. Um, my, um, my mother would vouch for that, too, if she was still alive. So. <clears throat> yeah. So, uh, go to another... Uh, interesting experience. Uh, either one of you. Yeah, this, um, I don't know if I jump in at once. Oh, yeah. Tell me about Kenny. So my, my youngest son, who's 30, he'll be 33 this year. Um, he was about maybe five or so when he came to me one night and told me, or one afternoon, I should say, told me about an experience that he had had where his father, my ex-husband, me and his older brother were taken with him, but we were suspended asleep in tanks of blue liquid. And he was on the exam table talking to the, his words, the captain. And there was an alien standing next to him who was telepathically talking to him. So I asked him to draw it because I was just so amazed at how detailed his description of everything that happened. Um, so this is his drawing. These are the blue tanks with myself, my older son, and my ex-husband. This is him on the table. This is one alien who has like a cape-like thing, which makes me think it was an elder, although they don't have hair. And this was on like um, a TV screen. And he, my son called him the captain. And they were both talking to him telepathically. And he asked if his brother could be with him. So they let him out of the tank, even though he was still in a sleep state and he was kind of like just standing next to 
my younger son while they examined the younger one. So, um, your the son you're talking about now. Uh, what is his name? Kenny. Kenny. And to this day, he still has experiences as well. My older son had experiences when he was younger. He either has blocked them out or doesn't want to talk to me about them, but he is just like my sister where they are tight lipped about it. And yet I remember when he was younger, he was interested. Yes, he was. So. And so, there's a three year age difference between the two boys. So does Kenny want to be on my show? I don't know. I've asked him because some people have asked that after they've interviewed me, they wanted to interview Kenny. Kenny has a very strange schedule. He's he's a sergeant for a armed security company. And I don't know if he thinks it might interfere with his work, if people might not take him seriously or whatever. But I think he he doesn't mind talking about it to people, but he's never actually been on a show to talk about it. So he's. Not closed about it. He just hasn't gone public. Correct. Well, ask him. Ask him next time you talk to him. I will. I'll ask him. I'll ask him. I mean, he he still gets the paralysis. Like I, I haven't had that in years, but he's he's had it up until recently. Um, he's heard these strange buzzing sounds. He and his ex-wife left here. They now are back in Florida. All my kids are in Florida. All my grandkids are in Florida. Um. But all of these experiences happened in New York, then Florida, and then here. So everywhere I've been, it seems like it has followed me. So where are you at now? New York? We're in Mexico. Oh, New Mexico, that's right. Yeah. So you're in Rio Grande. Rio Rancho. Rio Rancho. It's very sorry. small town. They're still building but, it up. But the Rio Grande River does run through it. Yeah. So <laughs> just to make it more confusing. <laughs> So Everything in this place has the word Rio in Rio, front of it. So God or, forbid. Or Vista or Mountain or Yeah. So you know you know Sue Walker and uh Yep, and her husband. Mm -hmm. Uh what's her husband's name again? Uh Red and White Otter. Ot we call him Otter. Mm -hmm. Is it White Otter, right? Yeah, but we call him Otter. Okay. And uh so I think if I'm not mistaken, the Ponte predicted contact. Uh, the initial first contact is coming up soon, yes. Well, they were saying like 22, I think, is when it was supposed to happen. Uh, uh, if not... That was the, the initial thing, but I think, unfortunately, COVID and some other things got in the way. But whatever. Um, I know it's happening. I'm, I'm waiting to wake up, actually, and just see a ship hovering in my backyard. Yeah. That's what I'm waiting for. Mostly what we see is hot air balloons, but. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, give it, uh, go anywhere you want to go with another interesting experience, either one of you. Where do you want to start? I mean, his started when he was very young, too, so have at it. Um, There's so many. It's hard to just pick one and say, all right, this. Well, you just. Uh, you just go from one to the next and just keep going and don't stop. You got days, days and days. It takes days. Well, I have as long as you, as you, <laughs> as you can last. I can last. I can outlast you. <laughs> um, I talk a lot about this initially in, in my books. It's just interspersed in the books I've written. Um, but I know my experience is my earliest recollection is four years old, but that didn't come about until a massive total recall or first awakening took place at the age of 21. That's when it all exploded and kicked off for me. Um, I always knew, you know, the way my mom and I gravitated towards it. My mom practically raised me on Star Trek and Close Encounters and all that stuff um, and Star Wars, but it just it, there was a connection that my mom and I had to all of this um, in the uh, awakening I had at the age of 21 um, 
it was like the whole cluster bomb of recoil came back from everything from four years old up to that point. And anything, everything that I thought I had just passed off as a nightmare or a dream, all of a sudden I realized, oh, that's a memory. That wasn't a dream, okay? Um, and at that very moment, it was maybe like a, a trigger or something that probably rang out to this entity that had always been there since I was a child um, that I referred to and described in the book as the crone. I have also referred to her as mother, mm -hmm. but I describe her as the crone because that more so fits her personality, runs parallel to what Native Americans refer to in their own mythology as the crone. Um, she's a bipedal female praying mantis, very tall. Um, she can range wherever wherever the hell she wants to, from nine feet up to 15 feet. It just depends on what day of the week it is because she has a very large head, large eyes, um, very small lower features, which you might call a nose and a mouth, mostly talks telepathically mm -hmm. and wears a dark brown cloak. Sometimes she has the hood over her head, sometimes not. Most of the time you see her head and her hands um, exposed from the cloak, um, but on rare moments I have seen the rest of her body exposed inside the cloak too. Um, the cloak has its own quality that gives a mystique to the way she moves through space or moves across the floor. Sometimes you wonder if she even has feet, but um, I have seen her full body pose and that's how I knew, okay, female praying mantis. That um, after that, during that awakening, she made herself known to me. And the first thing out of my mouth when I saw her was, hey, I know you, but I don't know how I know you. How do I know you? And as we started going through the total recall together, then I realized that dark figure that was always hovering in the back of my quote unquote dreams was her keeping herself hidden in the background and obscured, but watching over me and, and my brother as we got older. Um, and just waiting to that point where things sprang up at a certain age, it could happen with anybody. For me, it was 21 when everything came to the forefront. And then she decided, okay, now's the time to confront him and let him know what's been going on with his family bloodline. And that's when I realized, okay, this in that conversation, um, I realized this has affected my mother. This affected my grandmother. Um, I wish to this day, with all the conversations I had with my mom after that, it brought to light a lot of things for her, explained things for her that she thought she was just abnormal and screwed up in the head. And once I started talking to her about what was really going on, then she realized she wasn't insane. She realized these were real experiences she was having too. Um, things she's described, I won't repeat it here, but things she's described to us about, she was supposed to have four children. She only had two, my brother and I, and what she described happening to the other two in between made me rethink the whole scenario as to what might've happened to them, mm -hmm. even though my mom couldn't explain it. Um, and then I wish at that point, I, I always wished I could go back in time to when my grandmother was still alive and sit down and talk with her about this because my grandmother had um, a great level of psychic ability, which my grandfather recognized as being true. Um, she had a foresight, a vision. She would tell us things coming down the pike. Um, she was very interested in uh, things like Nostradamus and extraterrestrial contact to a certain extent, although it wasn't a real conversation. That was the extraterrestrial part was more so a conversation between mom and I. And then um, as time went during that initial awakening at 21, when that conversation with the crone began, this is when the whole thing with the um, existence of the sisterhood came to light. And this is a matriarchal and um, organization, for lack of a better term, that serves as a go-between between the uh, benevolent factions of the galactic community 
and the children of Earth, because mainly their function is to protect um, mostly gifted children, indigos, super psychics, um, uh, hybrids, okay? And um, they watch them just like they did long ago with what's referred to um, in religion as Christ children. They watch them too to make sure that the bad guys don't get their claws in them first and keep them protected um, so that until they get to a point, maybe the age of 21 or somewhere like that, when they're older and able to stand on their own two feet and defend themselves. Um, so it's not like there aren't male entities in the sisterhood. It's just that predominantly it's a matriarchy of all different extraterrestrial types, um, humans included, but you'll see others that look um, uh, very tall with thin necks and small heads. Um, you'll see others that have different skin colors. Um, blue, ones. blue, you'll see green, you'll mm -hmm. see uh, yellow or orange. Um, you'll see black and brown skin like we have here on Earth. Um, many of those are the human ones. Um, and they don't see the crone as their leader, but that's how she functions. She's referred to as the uh, um, sh uh, sh um, um, what is it? The, uh, the Shazadi. Um, but personally, like the way Linda knows her, she's referred to in-house as Prima Mati. Um, anyway, she started watching over me when I was four years old. And then when I had that total recall, I started understanding where all those strange and bizarre nightmares were coming from that I couldn't explain at the kid as a kid. One of them being um, in my bedroom, my stuffed animals would always come alive and start talking to me. And I thought some of them were friendly. And then one day, a couple of them became very um, violent and aggressive. So I ran from the bedroom across the hallway into the kitchen. For some reason, the kitchen was considered the safe zone. They couldn't cross the hallway into the kitchen. And so here's this tall stuffed bunny rabbit, this stuffed lion, stuffed teddy bear, raggedy and doll. They're all standing at the doorway of my bedroom with this menacing look on their face. And as I started looking from the kitchen back at them, I started pulling away the veil of the illusion and seeing who and what they really were, which were these other extraterrestrial beings that had more of that traditional gray look to them. And I could hear their thoughts. They were thinking, why is he looking at us? He sees who we are. <laughs> Shit. How does he do that? You know, uh, this is no good. We got to get rid of him. We can't touch him. Of course we can. Okay, then you try go into the kitchen and watch how fast you get vaporized. You know, it was that kind of conversation. <laughs> so um, they realized that I could see right through it and see who they were. And they weren't really my stuffed animals. It was just an illusion they were using. But, you know, when you put that kind of... <laughs> mark on a kid's memory it becomes very hard to go back into the bedroom and separate the real stuffed animals from these others that were coming in and pretending to be um, but they realized okay we can't touch this one this one's protected and i think that's my earliest recollection at about uh four or five six years old that there was something else going on in those memories dreams, nightmares, that um, made me feel a sense of, um, a strange sense of protection, like there was something else there watching over me, which of course I found out at 21 who and what that was. Um, there were other experiences. Hold on, where, before, before yes. you go on. Yeah. Okay, so, um, uh, so we know who is protecting you. Mm -hmm. Tell us more about the aliens that were not so nice that you were looking at across the hallway while you were being protected. Tell us, tell tell the audience more about the bad guys that, uh, um, that you're being protected against that you just talked about. More, uh, you know, like visual yeah. details. What did they look like? Um, they would look a lot like they had. Mm, 
ashy, pale skin, and almost like the Walking Dead. But they had the almond-shaped eyes, um, dark, and they were not living entities, as we might think. So I often tell people, look, there's a big difference between what I describe in the book as the greys like, um, versus other thing, other beings like the Ponti or the Zeta Reticuli or whoever, those are living beings. They have a soul. They're real. Okay. Those are not the ones hunting you down or threatening you. The ones I refer to as the greys, I make a point of pointing out that they are extremely advanced cybernetic organisms, um, but they're so advanced, you'd be hard pressed to try and differentiate them from a living person. Okay. Um, they can calculate at phenomenal speeds, every variable. Um, so of course it pisses them off when their probability factors are interfered with by the sisterhood. And uh, that's what they look like. Now they take their marching orders from um, <clears throat> their bosses, which happen to be reptilian queens. And the queens themselves have very pale skin, but their underlings like what you might call the Dracos or the Warriors, they have darker brown, greenish brown skin. Um, and these ones I call the greys, who are basically, when you're, you know how people will say, um, I felt like I was being scanned or that they were looking right through me. There's a reason for that. Everything they see through their eyes as advanced cybernetic beings is being recorded and sent back to the reptilian queens. That's why people feel like that. So they are put to the task of taking care of doing the dirty work. Um, if you want to refer to it in a manner that people that can relate to, then I'd say the queens are upper management and the greys are middle management. So um, that describes it there. Uh, there have been other variations of reptilian races too. Those are not all the bad guys. Some of them are like um, the, the ones that are in a feudal system of royalty. Um, but there are others who broke away. Um, in my experiences, I've had a reptilian warrior who sided with me and broke away because he knew what his people were doing is wrong. So there's a contingent out there that is rebelling against that. So, and I think people should need to know that. On top of that, people need to, it, Linda alluded to this before, people need to realize that what they're referring to as the greys may not be the greys as I describe them in the book. Because I know some people um, kind of get their ass in an uproar the way I describe them. Like, well, that's not the experiences I had. Well, then the ones I'm talking about are not the ones you experience. Totally different race. It'd be no different than taking me and dumping me in the middle of Southeast Asia and then expecting me to know the difference between someone who is Thai, someone who is Japanese, someone who is Chinese, someone who is Vietnamese. Sure, it might take me a year or two and then I'll have it down pat and I'll know who is who. But drop me there and expect me to figure out in five minutes? No. And I, this is the conundrum that for the last 80 years of experiences that people have been reporting, um, this is what the conundrum people are in. They haven't learned maybe to tell the difference. Um, and yet we have any number of high profile depictions or amateur depictions that show them in all different ways. And for some reason, we just keep amalgamating them into one stereotype. And it's like, no, there are thousands of different ones out there, just like there's a bazillion different Asians, a bazillion different Africans, a bazillion different Europeans, okay? Um, you just got to get used to the differences between them. Um, I had one person ask me one time, how many different UFOs are out there? And I came back at them and said, how many different cars are manufactured in your own backyard? And they couldn't answer that. I said, well, why do you give a shit about UFOs if you don't even know what's happening in your own backyard? Figure out what's going on in your own planet first before you start poking your nose in someone else's territory because that's not your business. So going with your, uh, your experiences, uh, I sidetracked you into what they look like. And, uh, but you were about to talk about your actual experiences. So going with that. Um, 
What was the other one that had come to mind? Uh, oh, yeah. Uh, there was a real powerful experience. After, after the opening reception where Linda and I had met each other, once the reception was over, um, I had to close down everything, say goodbye to everyone, and uh, say goodbye to my parents and Rob and at that time his fiance. They all left. Um, I was driving home, and for whatever reason, I had what must have been a blackout period where I knew how to get home, and all of a sudden my memory just went out the window. And I was 25 at the time. Where my memory went, I don't know, but all of a sudden I was lost and I couldn't figure out how to get home. I had to call my parents and that took a while, just remembering the phone number. And then I recalled it uh, through a lot of difficulty, called them and I said, um, mom, that I don't know where the hell I am. I don't know what's going on here. Where am I? You're on Long Island. You're in New York. Do you remember how to get home? No, I don't even know where I am. What town am I in? And so they talked to me for a while. And eventually um, it uh, had been about a half hour later that my memory came back. But um, I had to actually pull off to the side of the road and figure out what the hell was going on. I just, psh, memory gone. Um, so that was a interesting follow up to the opening reception with the artwork and everything all everything that was going on with the artwork and, and the topics being depicted there. Um, sometime later, when I had moved everything over from my gallery at college, I graduated, that was about, oh, 96. Um, I had set up shop briefly on the second floor apartment over my parents and wanted to continue my artwork there. I had a particular experience one night where a um, very um, aggressive and not so nice entity came to my apartment into what I had set up as a gallery, uh, saw what I was doing with my artwork and basically pinned me against the wall and said, we see what you've been doing. Now you're going to do it for us. And I said, no, I'm not. And you're not supposed to be here you know what the rule is and then all of a sudden this look of fear came over this entity's face and it had a scaly look to it um very much like an iguana okay um but had very very thick forehead very thick features all over the forehead and it had this look of dread come over it and all of a sudden i fell down from the wall because whatever force it was using <clears throat> it was made to release me and I had this false sense of confidence at that point. I said, see, I told you, you can't mess with me. And then I realized what was really going on. There was this huge dark shadow that came over the back of me and I see this hand. I could, I knew it was the crone's hand. She waved it over me and froze that entity in place because it was trying to get away. And then she proceeded to do something I didn't expect. She vivisected the living shit out of it, turned its entrails inside out into a ball of just basically something that looked like a gut box and sent it back through some kind of a portal that was about this big to somewhere else. And she said, I, I turned to her and I said, what, what, what just happened? What did? And she just looked at me and she said, I sent that thing back to wherever it came from. I just sent them a message they won't mess with you or bother you ever again. And that was the end of that. So um, there was an earlier experience <clears throat> many years earlier when I have first started out in college focusing on the artwork. I was actually at that time, the upstairs wasn't available. So I had set up a small gallery space in my parents' basement. I was down there a lot, uh, painting and airbrushing one of the paintings, one of the images, which was kind this of one? A, yeah. Okay. Which was actually when I started doing this painting, I was about halfway through it. And uh, I, I was pushing myself quite a bit to get the paintings done and, and move the whole project along for college. 
Um, and I guess I must have gone into a lucid state. And something at that point, while I was in that state, what was strange was I still thought I was painting, but I wasn't. Um, I must have stopped dead in my tracks, but in my mind, I was continuing on like it was nobody's business with the canvas. Something came up the side of me. It was this side, my right side, and looked at the painting and then turned its head to look at me. And it was one of those extraterrestrial beings that you might generically describe as a gray. And it was I got this sense that it was approving what I was doing and it shook its head slightly uh, and then it touched me as it was looking into my eyes and then I came out of the lucid state and realized I wasn't painting at all even though I thought it was and that was something that's an experience that always stuck with me in the basement um, so it became a little eerie to go back into the basement at that point to continue on but I did it and um, it was just an interesting affirmation as to the direction I was going in. Because for me, um, it wasn't just a case of, I let, I let other people just call it alien art. Okay, fine, that's the way they understood it. Let them call it whatever they want. But it really just wasn't that. What I was doing was more so taking all those issues surrounding alien contact and associating them and running parallels to, um, you know, real current affairs, social issues, and showing people how the two related to each other, cause and effect, action and reaction. That was the direction the artwork went in. So I understand I had that visit basically confirming, yes, we like what you're doing, continue on. Um, so then, things became um, more interesting along the way. Um, in further experiences, I became aware of the fact that what was going on here, the reason people like Linda and I were being watched over um, was that there was a group of us because there were other people involved with this too. Um, and it turned out there was a group of us being trained for in various ways because this uh, this sisterhood wanted to see if they could take this whole experiment all the way through adulthood instead of just watching the children and then cutting it off at a certain point <coughs> it was decided to follow some of us all the way into adulthood young adulthood and further on because something was coming around the bend <coughs> which um, I've alluded to in the books, and eventually I'm going to focus on specifically, but it was a case of where the reptilian queens were getting um, sick and tired of their operation being interfered with. <coughs> so they were going to send um, their own constituents to lay down the law and put things back in place. The sisterhood knew this was coming around the bend from, let's say, the 1970s right on up to the year 2001. And so they decided to spend that 30 year time frame to cultivate us and get us ready because the question was, under the right circumstances, would we able, be able to prove our mettle as being able to defend ourselves and stand our ground against these insurmountable odds and send a message back to this empire that you can't screw around with Earth anymore. You can't screw around with the human beings anymore. We are the masters of our own destiny. And basically, you need to get out and leave the rest of us alone. And it was that early to the early 2000s where that's when you started seeing more of an involvement with the benevolent factions moving in because then they realized the message had gone out to the galactic community that a stand had been taken and we put our foot down and said enough is enough stop screwing around with our children you know stop taking our children away uh because um it basically turned into what i describe as the hybrid war and where some of these special children were still being kidnapped 
brought to the Orion Empire where the reptilian queens are and then turned into these weapons of mass destruction. Um, and there was one point where I actually got to see what they turned into, which was pretty horrid. And some of them were retrieved and they would try to, the sister had tried to heal them and bring them back into the fold as living sentient entities instead of just these psycho killing machines. But basically they were locked away in a in a cylinder and they were forced to stay inside that cylinder they had one glass window that you could see almost like a fishbowl um but those are the ones that were treated pretty bad and many of them were children of these female types in the sisterhood they got so sick and tired of all of this crap going on that it culminated around the year 2001 with a huge confrontation going up against the reptilian queens and their elite group known as the Sia Car. Um, and that was where a lot of things were decided at that point. Um, turns out we came out on the winning side uh, just by the skin of our teeth and sent them back home licking their wounds. Um, of course, there were the usual threats. We'll be back. This is not over. This is our, you know, our territory. You can't just take it from us. And the point is, no, it's not. You know, by blood, Earth belongs to the human race. And so does the rest of the solar system. Um, and it would be nice to share it with the benevolent factions. That's why they're here trying to cultivate us to be caretakers of the land instead of destroying our own planet. Um, but first, you had to remove that bad element that basically gave us 10,000 years of bad behavior. And now we're trying to reverse that bad behavior by learning to take care of the planet better and have a better attitude towards our ecology and our environment. Um, because there aren't too many other planets to really travel to out there. And even if there was, well, that just says you didn't learn your lesson. Right now we have this, it, as interesting, and phenomenal as it is, we have this notion that we can just solve all our problems by going back to Mars, colonizing that, colonizing the moon, colonizing other moons around Jupiter and Saturn. But the point is, if we didn't learn our lesson here at home base, then we're just going to turn those other colonies into a real nasty shithole as well. So um that was the crux of it there with the way my ex my experiences had always been much more educational it wasn't on the victim side of things yeah because neither of us actually yeah there was a certain point where when i first started from my early 20s when i started getting involved with these extraterrestrial groups and it was the same theme over and over again everybody was talking about i've been taken um i've been abused I was raped, um, I was vivisected and then put back together. Uh, they, you know, they took uh, this from me, they took that from me. Um, all sorts of horrible stories. That was not my experience. And I started realizing well, what the hell is the difference here? I blame Hollywood for a lot of that too, because Hollywood loves to throw the fear factor in there. Well, there was that too, but these were people who were talking about it long before Hollywood even got involved. You know, these were the experiences people were talking about. Yeah, but where do they get it from? They get it from watching all these sci-fi movies and they, they twist it in their head. Granted, as a kid, my sister and I were a little scared because we didn't know what the hell, they, who these people, yeah. who these little people were. But as I got older, it's, it wasn't, I never felt like I was a victim. Ever. I didn't either, but I knew there were others who did. So that turned into, once again, a conversation with the crone. Why am I feeling so different from the pack, so to speak? You know, why is there this narrative running through the extraterrestrial community of abuse and victimhood? But it's nothing I can relate to, you know? Um, and so in that conversation, she pointed out, look, this is why we've been watching you. This is what's coming down the pike. This is why those people feel victimized because they are the byproduct of 
some pretty nasty historical abuse that traveled down their, their family bloodline and they haven't broken that bad karma yet. Um, and that relates to ancient aliens and things that were laid down by um, some not good, some good entities in the past that ended up giving us, like I said, 10,000 years of bad behavior in that sense of dominant dominance and invasion and all that. Um, so that was that's where that dividing line was between those of us that were contactees versus those of us that were abductees and why there was that abuse factor that I couldn't relate to because that wasn't happening to me. And yet I knew it was real for them. Yeah, I'm not saying it's real, mm -hmm. not real. But. So, so you, you, there's a there's fellow, a fellow his, his name off the top of my head. head. He talks, he talks about, about 39, 39 races, races, and he says 38 of them are not abducting anybody, but there's one one of the gray races that is doing all the abductions. And so um, I can't remember his name. Do you know who I'm talking about? And do you agree or disagree? Or I have a feeling there's a lot more than 39. But uh, I, You took the words right out of my mouth. There's a hell of a lot more than 39. As many grains of sand or as many stars in the sky, there's just as many uh, civilizations out mm -hmm. there. Whether or not they've been able to meet up with each other and create a network is another story. Some might be isolated just like we are, but there's plenty more that have banded together and created a network. Many of them are benevolent. They want to explore the cosmos. They want to explore other races, make contact. But of course, there's the prime directive don't mess with a less advanced species. Otherwise, you end up manipulating their belief system, which even under the best of circumstances, it's just too tempting, so you don't mess with it. Um, but there is then that minority of belligerent ones who just see profit margins and dollar signs with tradable commodities in each and every solar system. They see a solar system as a kingdom, and as far as they're concerned, whoever controls the throne of power in that kingdom lays claim to all the real estate in that kingdom, which, of course, here we're defining real estate as each and every planet, which is just a chunk of real estate in their eyes. Whoever lives on that planet is now chattel, slave, cheap slave labor that's built into the biosystem of that planet so that you don't have to import slaves from another planet which would create rebellion because of psychological problems by taking them out of their natural environment and sticking them in an alien environment. That doesn't work. So this is where the whole thing about genetic manipulation came up. How can we produce the perfect slave with it, within its own ecosystem? Whether it's genetics, brainwashing, social conditioning, take your pick, but that's what that minority of profit, profiteering races came about. And of course, those who are in power are not going to be so inclined to give it up so they're going to give a struggle because they don't want to give up their profit margins they don't want to be booted out of that solar system and have to go back and find some other place to make a profit off of and somebody else to enslave so yeah i would say the majority of what out what's out there is benevolent you want to call it starfleet or a confederation call it what you will the uh the old republic, like in Star Wars, pick your term, I don't care, but um, that's what's out there by majority. And it's definitely more than 39. It's well, just the, that, the <laughs> you know, it's the minority always knows how to scream a lot louder, so that's why they seem yeah. to have a dominant voice in the human experience. Mm -hmm. The 39 may just be, he's talking about the races visiting Earth, the gray races visiting Earth. Uh, not not in existence. He's probably talking about the ones that are visiting here, the gray races that are visiting Earth. It, it depends on how long ago he wrote that, because at, in the time he published the book, that might have been accurate. Um, I've been, we're in Linda, but Linda and I have talked with people involved with the Star Nations who are here to turn things around or help us take our own destiny and turn things around. And that number has more so evolved in upwards of at least 57, 58 or more star nations. 
Um, the other thing is, Star Nations, as genteel as that term sounds, Star Nations is just another generic term for those visiting here. It doesn't necessarily describe something, someone who is benevolent. They could just as easily be malevolent, but most of what's here is benevolent. So, um... And the Sisterhood's not going to let any of those malevolent beings destroy Earth. They will step yeah. in when they have to. They've taken a more aggressive approach because of what happened in the past in our ancient history, where the malevolent factions came in, guns blazing. The benevolent factions weren't ready for that, and they weren't ready to fight back. So they ran away with their tail between their legs at the time, abandoned the planet Earth, abandoned our primate ancestors, and basically left the sisterhood holding the bag trying to work it out. And that was a disaster. And this is why we went under that dark cloud of recovering our society over the last 10 to 12,000 years. And you going to say something. Yeah, go ahead. Oh, no, I'm, well, I wasn't. Uh, you go, go right ahead. This is your show. <laughs> so, no. yeah, I mean, it's just, and I don't know about you, but I don't want to go back through another 10 to 12,000 years of Dark bullshit, ages. medieval ages, disease, ignorance, the stupidity of religion or superstition that turned women into victims and black people into the seed of evil, you know, um, women being raped on the spot, summary executions left and right, you know, no sense of morality. It took us a long time, not until maybe what, the 1700s when we started realizing there's um, relevance to our humanity and recognizing each other. Um, and then it took another, what, 300 years after that to get to where we are. So um, I don't want to see us have to go through that cycle again, because <clears throat> when you look at the fossil record, it seems like we've been forced to go through this every 10 to 12,000 years mm -hmm. and it's happened over and over again. I don't feel like going through that again. I don't want to see uh, my kids, my grandkids. I don't want to see my nieces and their children go through this crap and have to descend into that darkness again. Um, it's depressing enough when you watch post apocalyptic movies like The Walking Dead to see what they lost and how they're struggling to put their human communities back together. That's a blueprint for all the crap we're going to have to go through if this all falls apart again. Mm -hmm. And yet you've got these people out there who don't realize they're being manipulated with all the rhetoric they say about, oh, let it all fall apart. It, you're just saying that because you just want to sit on your dead ass and not do anything. Well, that's just as bad as the people who are working against the human race. If you're not going to get involved, then you're just as much to blame. Mm -hmm. So, you know, that misanthropic antipathy needs to go away because there's no room for that in the 21st century or any century thereafter. Future generations are not going to put up with that. And you already see that in the you younger generation mm -hmm. right now. Um, children are looking at the stupidity of my generation and thinking, why the hell are we even listening to these people anymore? And there's a jump in the evolution now because of that extraterrestrial intervention, that hybridization, where these this new generation of children are much more aware, much more advanced, are picking up on advanced math and science much early, having much more of an interest in computer science. And I look at them and I'm thinking, where was I at six years old, 10 years old, 12 years old? I wasn't even close to where they are now. It's a totally different ball game now. And that's the influence of the benevolent factions to get us back to where we should be before it all fell apart 12,000 years ago. So there's a need to push us forward so that we don't make the same mistakes again. And a lot of that push has contributed to this paranoid backlash of, oh my God, you know, uh, they're going to come in and invade and take over. And no, they're not. <laughs> this is our planet. It's recognized non involvement unless we ask for help. And we're only going to get the help if we achieve a certain level of 
mental, psychological, and spiritual balance with the planet. If we can't achieve that balance, they're not going to just march in and help us because that defeats the purpose. There are people who say, well, why don't they just come down here and solve all of our problems? Well, if they did that, that pretty much negates the human experience right there. So why do you even exist? If you're just going to have some higher power come down and wipe your ass for you, what's the point of your existence? You're not learning anything. You're not taking the reins of destiny. Uh, tell me what you really believe. <laughs> hey, I would love to have someone come along like they did in the day the earth stood still and give us the cure for cancer or give us some magic salve that you wipe on a bullet wound and it's healed in 24 hours. You know, nothing wrong with that. <clears throat> but... But, I'm not yeah, gonna like, get into that. I'm not. Let's not talk I, about that. I agree with Linda. We do have those things, but they're being held back. Mm -hmm. And it would be nice to see those things brought to light. Even if, okay, fine. We know reverse engineering. We know that, but let the humans take the credit. You know, just like we allowed Thomas Edison to take the credit for the light bulb when it was actually the Egyptians who invented it five thousand years earlier. Okay. Mm -hmm. Um, but they Poor don't, Tom. yeah, uh, I don't know why people call him the father of invention. He didn't invent anything. He stole everything. <clears throat> All right. So, uh, what other experiences do you want to talk about? If any, um, you see what I like zero. Oh, um, there's so many. I don't even, it just. Let me see if I can pick one out that doesn't segue into anything else. <laughs> All of your stuff segues into... I will tell you that since we've been officially together as a couple in, in 2016, um, and he's shared a lot of his experiences, even the ones that we've had while living together, I've noticed that the majority of his experiences are tests it's almost like he's got to go through some kind of oh um, okay that triggers something for me yeah okay uh what's the word i'm looking for like a relay race of some sort where he's get put in a scenario it's probably a holographic scenario but regardless he's put into some life-threatening scenario of some sort which usually i'm either watching on the sidelines that he's told me when he's describing them all to me well I, or he's got to save people or it's just yeah. these bizarre things that he gets tested with and i think it's to prepare him for whatever it is that we're supposed to be doing come initial first contact yeah god that triggered One, what yeah that, that triggered a couple of things um i keep having these experiences uh, and I, I wake up in a cold sweat from them um, because it takes me right up to the point where this is the end of it for me. And so one such experience was I, I'm in, um, it's always an environment of maybe a broken down old factory that's combined with a shopping mall, that's combined with a hospital, that's combined with a library. There seems to be an amalgamation of these environments I'm walking through that are all there at the same time. And in one such scenario, I'm in, it was some kind of a multi-storied office building. I was up on a higher level looking out a window. Uh, there was some other entity. I knew it wasn't human, but it was in the room with me, in the shadows, talking to me. I could see the silhouette of it against the window, but I couldn't make out the features. Uh, it seemed to be very thin and wiry. Um, but shorter than me, like a head shorter, which was bizarre. And I was looking out the window with this entity, and this entity said, um, don't look out the window. Don't, don't look. You're not going to want to see what's there. Well, by that time, it was too late because I hear the sirens going off, and what I see out the window is this giant armada of ships, cylindrical ships, coming down, off in the distance, not too far away, but I see what building they're going after. And I knew that building had a very special child 
hiding in it, housed in it. It was like a laboratory. But these ships were going after that building because they were going after the child. I knew at that point I couldn't let them have the child. So I go running down the to the street and out, and all of a sudden, no, nobody seems to see this. Everybody else is just oblivious, and I'm trying to point it out. Um, well, that didn't do any good until it was too late. I go running to the laboratory to try and find the child. I grab it and start taking off down the main street. Well, at that point, they must have figured out what I did because now the ships turn around and start heading towards the main part of the city where I was, away from that laboratory. And nobody noticed still because they ran silent. That was so weird. They were just quiet. You wouldn't even have known if they were there if you didn't look up. As soon as they started coming over the city buildings, that's when you start hearing the explosions and concrete and steel is starting to collapse to the ground. Then people going into a panic and I'm trying to guide them out of the city, telling them come this way quick and I'm running with the child. Linda was next to me and we're trying to get out of the city fast enough before everything collapses on us. But there seems to be a repeating theme of protecting these children. Now that I'm older, that seems to be a responsibility. In another particular scenario, um, the ones I describe in the book, in my books as the Canis feudal lords, which a short description would be just consider, you know, a wolf or a werewolf walking on two legs, okay? Canis feudal lords, um, very cannibalistic, very belligerent. Um, there, I'm running down this dark corridor with this child in my arms that I knew I had to get this child to a certain destination. And it was not exactly 100% human. And it was something that I took from them that they were going to experiment on. And of course, they were pissed off. So they sent their henchmen after me, which is these, you know, they were running after me on all fours. And they stood up on twos and began running after me like that too. Uh, they were close enough to be snapping at my heels as I'm running at, uh, over these barricades and past these obstacles. And I knew where I was needing to get to. But unfortunately, I came to a dead end. There was no other place to go. And then right above me, there was this hole that opened up. And I knew it was a portal to a ship that was hovering. And Linda was there. And I handed the child up to her. I said, take it and get out of here. I'm staying. And then I turned and faced off against these feudal lords that were after me. That's when they stopped running on four legs, stood up on two legs, and were ready to all lunge at me. And I said, take your best shot. You can't do anything now. The child is gone. And at that point, they lunged at me. What was weird about that was that at that point, somebody came in, pulled me, and this is strange to explain, but this is where I suppose the holographic part comes into it. Somebody came in and yanked me out of my body as these werewolf type things were tearing me limb from limb. And it turned out it was the crone. And then she's standing there right next to me and making me watch them tear my body limb from limb. Now, the thing was, I felt all the pain, but it wasn't happening to me directly. And she says, I want you to feel this so that you know what these alien abductees are going through, because that experience came on the coattails of me realizing that there's something different between my experiences versus alien abductees. And I had gone to her in a conversation be careful what you ask for. This is where the lesson is learned and said to her, I wish I knew what they were going through. And she says, oh, really? OK, I'll show you. And that's when I was put into that scenario that I thought was so real. And at the last minute, she yanked me out and made me feel the pain of them ripping me limb from limb. And she says, that's what they feel. Now, do you understand? And I said, yeah, now I get it. You just triggered a memory of another experience with the two of us. What's that? The battle on the Nagamase. Well, yeah, I wasn't going to get into all of that, but what um, what I've been talking about here, what was leading up to 2001 with the confrontation was 
what came to Earth was, was their premier slave ship, which I describe in the book as the Negamase. That's what they called it. And on that were all of these hybrids that they had kidnapped and were experimenting with in horrid ways at the lower levels of the ship. This is where the sisterhood made their stand to rescue them and take them all back. Um, so in that confrontation, um, that's when these uh, assassins uh, that I refer to as, you know, the Sia Car came and confronted us. Um, I talk more about it in the book in detail, but what was involved there was that our, it, as it turned out, our daughter that we've been talking about, okay, um, turns out she, in an older form, had found a way through trial and error, and by older form I mean she was probably in her 50s at that point, um, but she found a way to come back through time knowing full well that the reptilian queens were playing dirty pool. And she knew what was going to happen. So the older version of our daughter came back. I refer to her as uh, Sister Starchild or J.M. Starchild in the book. Um, and she had known the crone from the future. Mm -hmm. When she came back to the present, present being 2001, present day crone, the one that I know, somehow had an affinity for her, somehow realized, oh, I've known you from my future self, right? And she goes, yeah. And she says, you gave me my, your blessing to do this. And it was an ultimate sacrifice because she knew that by coming back through time, that was it. Because, you know, in theoretical time travel, once you come back, there's no way to go forward to your own reality. That's it. You're severed. It's a one-way trip. And she made that sacrifice to come back for Linda and I to make damn sure that things didn't go the wrong way in this confrontation. So that led us to think, well, how many times before has this happened that she knows about that she's been trying to do this over and over again? Yeah. And what was interesting that in that is that we call her, the, I call her the time traveler just to differentiate her from our daughter. But she looked at her younger self, which at that point, you know, it was 2001 yeah about four or five years old right yeah okay she was born in 96 and she said yeah that's and she really you know that's me okay but that's also not me because the person who came back through time was now a different person okay wasn't part of the same timeline anymore but she made her peace with that and she got involved with the conflict there to make damn sure because she knew some of the details would be the same, even though some of the details would be completely different. Because when you go through that kind of an experience, time, if you try to repeat it, is like playing jazz. It's the same song, but it comes out a little different every time. There's always some kind of a small detail or a big detail that's very different. Mm -hmm. That's why it's dangerous to mess with it. Because even if you could control the reality you go back to in the future it would still be different mm -hmm. and that's a dangerous thing but coming back in time she decided to roll the dice on that knowing it was a one-way well, ticket to, because she knew what the outcome was so the crone knew what was going on yeah. linda knew what was going on i was the last one to find out that who this person was and then i realized what this was all about once i realized this is what our daughter did for us to make sure that things didn't go the wrong way this time. It turns out that in another version of that confrontation, I ended up dead. I wasn't supposed to live past that day. And in changing the outcome so that I didn't die that day, Linda felt the change in the timeline. It was almost something was different that day from that day forward. And Honestly, since 2001, I've realized that there are things that feel pretty strange to me at this point. Like, I'm here, but I'm not. I'm not supposed to be here, but I am. There's times where I'm feeling like I'm walking through the day, 
but it, it feels like um, like the way it feels on the end of your fingertips, like something's wrong, I can touch it, but something's different and I'm not really there. It's left a bizarre feeling once I found out what happened and that me existing after 2001 is a totally different reality at that point. So, <laughs> where do we go from here? Reaction. Uh, where, where do we go from here? What? What? Uh, it's almost two hours, and uh, yeah. we can stop here. Or we can keep going, or whatever you guys want to do. It's up to you. Well, we um, haven't eaten dinner. <laughs> so. I thought I thought you were eating there on the side there. Didn't you? Didn't you eat a bunch? I, of I stuff? started to, but I still have a full full thing, up, and he hasn't touched his. It's all right. Um, there was one other thing that was triggered before. Now, ten minutes later, I can't remember what it was. Um, it was the thing with, yeah, okay, no, no. I already talked about what I wanted to. Okay, I didn't forget, but. Um, Outside of that, um, I think I'll just stop it there for now. Okay, so, <laughs> so, um, is there anything you want to say to the audience before we end it? Like, uh, you know, go buy my book, here's my book, or whatever, you know, whatever, whatever you'd like to say to the uh, audience. Well, before the, we end the, this. The, the title of my book series I've written part one and part two. It's called The More, The Mason, and The Alien. Um, that's the first one. Um, the second one is of the same title, but it's called part two. That's the second one there. <laughs> okay. um, and I'm working on the third one right now, part three, which is called The Rise of the Invisible College. And I'm already planning out a part four as well. They can go to ufoteacher.com. Yeah. Um, and everything is there. Yeah, go to ufoteacher.com. That's our official website. Click on the book link at the top and you'll see our books listed there. Um, but that's, uh, and you'll even see the one I wrote as a prelude about 10 years earlier, way back. I published it in 2005 called The Legions of Light, Armies of Darkness. Um, and people have asked me, how does that book relate to the books you write now? I said, well, you know, The Hobbit. And then you know the Lord of the Rings. <laughs> That's the relationship. Okay. Legion of Light, Armies of Darkness is the Hobbit. And then the books I've written now represent Lord of the Rings. That's the relationship. So, but um, I, I had gone in such a uh, strange direction with that initial book years ago that I tell people it's probably better you read the books I've written recently and then go back and read the prelude and then you'll yeah. understand it that much better. Mm -hmm. So, but that pretty much covers it, you know, and you can see our bios on the website too and read about us there. Okay, well, it's been a pleasure having you on. It was fascinating yeah. and uh, I really appreciate you being on the show and uh, I will go ahead and end the recording now and we'll, um, thanks, uh, I'll post it on YouTube and we'll go from there. Appreciate it. Thank, Thank you, you very much. It's been an honor being on the show. Let me stop it. Uh...